Hey guys, this is Savannah from earthandwater.co. Today I'm here with a guest, Jahan Satur. He's a self-sabotage and mindfulness coach. And you also have your own podcast as well, don't you? Yes, I do. Boundless Authenticity. Boundless Authenticity. And I think that is perfect because, um, you know, the universe aligns and we find ourselves kind of certain subjects will repeat themselves in a period of time like you know trying to communicate with us about something that needs to be worked on and authenticity is something that comes up a lot uh and has through the years but I have found myself talking about authenticity this will be the third time in two days just by chance and first time on the podcast I've talked about it with people like in the real life and everything and how authenticity is a really hard subject for a lot of us to wrap our heads around because for a lot of reasons for one we uh, we're cultured in wherever we're at to be like the culture of that location so as we get older and especially with the internet coming into now it was easier for people to just be like the other people around you until you know, now we see all of these different varieties and options that we have. And now we're trying to figure out individually, who are we as, you know, who am I as Savannah? Who are you as Jehan? It's complicated, especially when it's constantly molding per our new situations and scenarios and circumstances that we interact with every day. We're always changing, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, should be a lifelong goal to want to change a little bit just in small increments people have this idea now where the personal development and spirituality realm has taken over everything and so everybody's like i've got to change i have to change something today and if they don't then they feel bad about that but really authenticity is just a form of integration who are you right now in this moment today? And what lessons have you learned? How can I make a difference with the insight that I've gained from the mistakes that I've made? You know? Yeah, because really all we ever have is right now in this moment. And that's what we're all trying to learn with like meditation, personal development, all of that. Really mindfulness. It It seems like a big thing to conquer but only because it's such a new concept to be integrated into the regular everyday of society but really it's just being hyper aware of the moment in the moment yeah absolutely and i mean what you said is so true if i said the same thing you just said it would sound like inner transformation is just so we can adapt to the external world it's not to burst into a million atoms and have super spiritual experiences and you know float on to different parts of the universe although it, that that's nice too but you can't really do anything with that here you can't touch anybody's soul here on the planet so i mean i love how you started the conversation you talked about how we're cultured and the biggest problem that we have in society today is that when somebody doesn't know their identity as a fragment of consciousness just occupying a temporary vehicle for the expression of that consciousness they're going to grab at any label or any identity that's coming from the pipeline and any old thing will do and so that's the crutch that most people are leaning on and they love it you know they love it subconsciously they are consenting to their own enslavement if you will and one of my mentors, when I first started, Bill Harris, he's now passed on. He used to say, beliefs are self-fulfilling prophecies. Mm -hmm. So whatever we identify with on the outside, that's who we become. But that is hardly really who we are at the core. And so I, I always talk about how one of my first classes with clients is usually about values. And hardly anybody chooses integrity or authenticity hmm. they don't know what those things mean anymore they, don't. they have lost value they've been degraded and some people are really comfortable in that they don't want to identify you know as because 
it's hard trying to figure out who you are in the world that we've built around us that we have to still live in and be a part of. It's really hard to exit the societal and cultural norms. The so-called matrix, right? That's it. I mean, years ago before technology, we can't necessarily point a finger solely at technology because people are still making a choice there. But mm -hmm. I do have to say that years ago when you had to call someone on a landline phone and you didn't know if they were home, times were different. There was none of this stuff that we have now. And the always on state of being wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. So people spent a lot of time alone inside their heads. People still struggled maybe with similar issues that we have today, but on a very, very small level, and they were able to resolve it because we had more community. We had more deep, true friendships. We actually, actually had to talk to each other. We had to resolve our issues with each other face-to-face -face or not have it be resolved at all. Mm -hmm. And that pushed us to grow in terms of emotional maturity, strength of character, and things like that. So the society that we we're living in are it's really skewed right now and so many people are hurting over things that are actually smaller than they think they are mm -hmm. because they won't give themselves a chance and that's what self-sabotage is about it's about giving yourself a chance are the things that you're doing affecting you negatively i don't know you know like that's that's for each person to decide i can talk about broad topics about you know how tv and these things affect us but most that's because most people misuse the technology most people feel as though they're entitled to put substances in their body that harms them because they've been trained they've been conditioned to be fat sick and stupid mm. right and that's unfortunate so that's you know that's the, i can i think that's the crux of the matter because when we're focusing on everything except for our truth on the inside, then how can we really be authentic? How can we really live with integrity? How can we really even learn to focus our compassion on anyone else or on ourselves for that matter, when everything in our head is just being diluted by millions of different voices every day, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what it is. It's just a lot of input. And as, you know, an individual, we don't have the capacity to output as much as that we're inputting. And it creates that um, friction when you're trying to find the balance of, you know, because everything's go, 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 busy, busy, um, distractions, constantly flashing screens. And when our nervous system isn't built for that. And we're, so we're falling into overwhelm, anxiety, stress, which then makes us sicker. And I talk a lot about, cause you know, we have all this yang energy already that we have to balance it out with the yin energy, which is slowing things down. You know, I had to teach myself how to talk slower because I was constantly trying to rush through it because people were, they didn't have a whole lot of time to listen to me. So I had to get to the point and, you know, spit it out. And when you can learn how to slow down a little bit, not only in the speech, but also meditation, that's where you're going to yeah. find the balance. Yeah. Mindfulness is key. Um, especially when you're dealing with self-sabotage because people just do things that they are not aware of. Hardly anyone on this street, if you go and you ask them, how aware are you of how aware you are? They go, what? Yeah, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, exactly. And they don't understand that they're not consciously doing the majority of the stuff that they do. Yeah. So that's where things get a little bit like, scary for people because they don't want to admit that they're not in control and actually so many people are walking around with these control issues they're, they're barely holding on to what they have right now it's hard for them to admit and mindfulness just breathing as you would know as a yoga instructor game changer because it completely slows down the frequency of your thoughts 
it rearranges everything into a particular order of thought what is the most important thing but it's your responsibility to then go head first at that mm-hmm. don't let thoughts pass you by this notion that you just watch things and then you breathe and it'll go away that doesn't actually do anything it just goes back in the subconscious mm-hmm. so we often get taught in western spirituality to do the same things that we've been doing before just in a different way and um a lot of the people that i come across especially on one-to-one sessions and stuff they've been through the basics and they understand a little bit and they're doing their yoga and they're doing their meditation but they can't shift thoughts they can't get rid of beliefs they are stuck doing the same affirmations for the past two years and wondering why nothing has changed and so you know these are the major issues that i deal with and i find that most people are just stressed out oh yeah most people (laughs) most people are just stressed out they've just come across mindfulness or something else yoga or something and they have no idea what to do with any of that it's made an impact but on a very small level and i think now is the time for people like us to get out there and start talking really loudly above the narrative above the government narrative above the media narrative Mm -hmm. because people are ready to actually find out how to tap in on the deepest of levels you know I agree. I think they absolutely are too. You know, we had to get to this point and it feels like it's been a really slow progress and in a lot of ways it has, but then in a lot of ways it hasn't. Um, I'm not sure how old you are, but I definitely did not grow up with the internet or smartphones or anything like that. So that being said, just to say that it has not been around very long at all. And that's what gave us the ability to kind of make leaps and strides towards the progress and towards being ready to actually do the work. But, and you know, like on the internet, when we're all connected and we're all talking about these things, it's easy for us to be like, oh, this is so prominent. Oh, people do want this. And, but out in the field, in real life, most people, although we recognize that that's what they want, most of them don't realize that that's what they want. So, you know, how do we, catch their attention and it you know convince them that it's not all just um new age mumbo jumbo that i you know i see your problems and i see that you're anxious and i see that you're overwhelmed and overworked and stressed out and you've got relationship problems and trust issues with both yourself and others and you know there's all of these things and yeah you got you got some sick going on because our standard american diet is terrible and uh I'm I'm really not sure how I think a lot of other countries do a lot better with food than we do for sure, but um, I haven't studied it anyway. Moving on, um, and it's like yeah. yeah, we don't have a cure all per se, but I can teach you how to be really aware of yourself and your body and your own thoughts and your own actions, so that when you do notice these patterns, well, for one, you have to notice that there are patterns. And then you can work to correct them when the moment comes. Yeah, you're right. I mean, diet is a big part of it. I live in Barbados, like I said. Yes. And that's where I was born, but I lived in America for some time. And when I left, which was years ago, um, it's over 10 years ago now, I realized that things were coming into play here just around the time I was leaving where uh, you could say Barbados has become Americanized in terms of the diet. Uh. And, right. And so I wondered if a place that is so small and it kind of exists in a vacuum could become Americanized like that, how much of the rest of the world, their shelves are becoming stocked with the same garbage is because essentially that's all it is. It's trash. Mm-hmm. And if you treat your body like a garbage dump, then it's no surprise that you don't feel well. Mm-hmm. So um, convenience has been weaponized. Mm-hmm. And that's the biggest problem because people don't understand that 
we are being overstimulated mm -hmm. by everything that's on the screens. That's another story in itself. I'll get to that. On purpose. But the role of the limbic system on purpose, but the role of the limbic system is to keep us feeling safe. It's a recording device. It remembers everything that happened and it's trying to predict what's going on mm -hmm. through your subconscious. But when you're under stress, you're constantly running negative programming. And most people are comfortable with their negative programming. They actually think that it's great because they went out to a party last night and they had a good time and they got drunk with their friends and they think that's great because they've been trained to think that that's great. But then a few days later, they feel anxious. They feel depressed. They don't know what's going on. Something in their environment is triggering this response. And a lot of people don't look at what they're putting in their bodies. They think that I can consciously do this, but they're unaware of the fact that they're actually not consciously doing that. They're just running a program. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people out there that will fight you tooth and nail saying, oh. I'm consciously choosing this when they're really not. It's a response to something else. Mm -hmm. And so where's the impetus to change? If when you look at a screen, it's giving you dopamine, you feel good. Mm -hmm. Where's Where's my reason to change? Mm -hmm. And it depletes all your serotonin. Serotonin is that thing that kind of tells us, okay, that's enough. Pack it in. It's time to stop now. And so that transfers over to other areas of our lives. We don't know when to put down the Doritos. Well, first of all, if somebody thinks Doritos is food, you can't help them really. They're, mm -hmm. they're not at that stage of readiness at all. But that's the way it is with the majority of things. And we have no clue these days what has been done to anything that we put in our mouths. Yeah. We just pick up a can of something or pick up a bag full of something or even just pasta or something. We just throw it in the pot and we don't think about what has been done to this before we put it in there. And that's the one thing that's triggering off so many people's anxiety and so much depression and so much other things that get labeled as disease, which by the way, if you label something as a disease, it makes it 10,000 times harder in your mind to overcome. Absolutely. So you see how that works for a lot of people who don't realize that. That's why I, I won't go to the doctor. My, <laughs> my family, <laughs> my husband is very like, we need to go get checkups and we need to go get blood work. And I'm like, mm -mm -mm, absolutely not. I'm just going to kill over one day and like, it's going to be a surprise for everybody. And that's okay. Uh, Cause we all end up there anyway, but you, and, and you know, I don't want to get into like conspiracy type things. I'm just from my experiences and what I have done research on and what I have experienced and noticed and dealt with, with like the healthcare system, uh, it only makes things worse most of the time. And, you know, if someone gets diagnosed with, say, cancer, and they oftentimes go one of two ways, and I've noticed that their attitude and mindset about it dictates which direction they go more than any treatments they can get. And, you know, some people are like, oh, well, you know, just take me out. I'm done. And they like lay down and die basically. And it doesn't matter what kind of treatments that they get. That's going to be the end outcome because that's what they have in their body, in their mind as a belief, as a thought, as a focus point. Whereas you have other people who wave it off and they're like, no, I'm going to win. I'm going to fight this. I'm going to go skydiving or oh, whatever. And whatever you know there's there's lots of factors obviously but your mindset and your belief system has a ton more to do with your ability to heal than pills can do and again that's not universal i'm not anti western medicine and healthcare i think that there should be a integration of both eastern practices and western practices to find what works best for each individual but also the main responsibility of the health of the individual falls on the individual themselves 
Well, Hippocrates himself, who incidentally would be rolling in the grave if he knew what was happening right now, oh. he even said that every person is their own best doctor. Yes. And um, the challenge there is that, you know, not to get into conspiracy territory, uh, conspiracy is just the word that has been created by think tanks yeah. to marginalize people who have the capability to test the narrative and to think for themselves. Yeah. And that's the biggest problem there because people are hurting. That's yeah. not a joke, right? Yeah. But to the people who run around saying that's a conspiracy theory, they're making it a joke. They're making a mockery of people who just want to heal, who just want to be better. And that's the tribal mentality that we all fall into. Mm -hmm. And that's what the television is for, to keep us entertained, to keep us in a small perspective that tricks us into thinking that this is what the majority of people are doing when in reality it's not. Mm -hmm. And that's the part of the, the mind control on the planet, not to go that direction too far into it. Uh, so to shift that, I would say that there's a particular language that the subconscious uses. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have not heard this, so I'm going to say it. The subconscious mind does not think in terms of the way that we are taught to when we say affirmations. So if I say I am enough, mm -hmm. the subconscious mind says no. So the actual sentence is I am enough, comma, no. It's kind of like entering into like you remember the old ms dos computer things you see people typing stuff on a black screen and they just be typing those commands in it's like that you press enter and it goes so every time someone's saying i am enough and that's not their reality it doesn't matter how many times they say it even though the subconscious mind loves repetition it will not yield to that it will it will continue to fill in the gap after that no and so that's why people don't change so when people are saying that they're relying on a system, a savior, to make them feel better, they're usually operating out of a couple of different programs. But one that I found to be very common is I don't understand what it feels like to be loved and supported by the creator of all that is. Mm. They, they've lost their connection to divinity. And so there's a guy called Andrew Newberg at um, the Pennsylvania University for Science in the Mind that uh, he quantified in his experiments that without a connection to the divine through whether it's regular religion or some kind of spirituality, whatever it is you believe in, um, you begin to die. Everything begins to atrophy in the body. You go the opposite way. So when someone subconsciously doesn't feel supported by all of life everywhere and they don't have faith in anything, they're dying. Cell death is occurring. So you add on top of that food that doesn't feed the mitochondria, which a quick science lesson, anybody that doesn't know what the mitochondria does, it's the part of the cell that makes everything electricity and powers your batteries and causes the cells to regenerate. But you don't feed that. You're in cell death. That's why we have 80-year-olds today that look like they're 150, whereas our grandparents, they were still big and strong and they could lift boulders and do menial work. And they, they really did that until the day they eventually just keeled over from natural causes. You know, that was it. That was all she wrote. Mm -hmm. And so we're dealing with <laughs> hundreds of, I wouldn't call them, micro attacks but essentially that's what they come down to again because convenience has been weaponized we've been trained into a pill for every ill and right now we're actually in a, a dangerous time because all of the information about western medicine is being pushed to the forefront all of the fake science the pseudoscience is being put up front, and that's what's ranking on Google. Mm -hmm. And all of the stuff about Eastern philosophy is being deleted from the internet mm -hmm. or being fact-checked or changed mm -hmm. in some way 
to pervert the system and redirect people right back to allopathic medicine. But as we already know, iatrogenics, medical practice, is the third leading cause of death next mm-hmm. to cancer and heart disease, right? Yep. That's a serious thing. Medical practice, not medical malpractice, not the stuff that they're doing that's good. Medical practice in general. Mm-hmm. So how can we overcome something like that mm-hmm. unless we all begin to have conversations about it in private because they don't want us talking about it in public. So we have to gather with our friends in small groups and say, hey, here's what I found. Don't get mad, but here's what I found. <laughs> You know, and really be willing to up level our belief systems because what is a belief anyway, other than the best conclusion that we have come to at this point? Mm-hmm. And usually it's coming from someone else other than us, right? Yeah, uh, I have a someone in my life who just finished massage therapy school, and uh, I actually just left, I was with her 30 minutes ago, right before I was with you, we were having breakfast. And uh, she was telling me about how she just graduated. She just got her license. She passed the board. She's trying to start her business, but she has to jump through all of these legal hoops to be a massage therapist. And me and her were talking. I was like, massage therapy is so heavily regulated, like in comparison to all these other fields that can actually do damage to someone. And this is what they're heavily regulating for why other than it's too anti-pharmaceutical, essentially. Um, And the same thing with herbs and, you know, herbal medicines there. It's illegal to claim that they can do anything. Which puts us all between a rock and a hard place because you have people who have this knowledge and it's. But they they also, the narrative is that we should be fearful of the herbs and that knowledge. Like when I was pregnant with my children, I, I had family members get all bent out of shape because I was drinking herbal tea. And in the same breath, they would ask me if I was taking my medications for this or that. Like, you understand that this is an herbal tea that you were stressed out about and combating me about, but the chemical pills, those you're encouraging, it, make it make sense. And like, I understand that medical school is like <laughs> this whole thing and like, it's a whole science and, but it's also what most people don't understand is that it's tainted but by the universities that they go to. Because whoever funds the universities has say over what the curriculum is, and they can literally pick and choose whatever curriculum they decide they want to push on these doctors. And then these doctors who go into it meaning well with all of the best intentions in the world, just take that knowledge as face value. And now they're practicing that. And I was a birth doula for a while because, uh, solely because from my own participation in the health care system as a mother, I uh, saw all the discrepancies between we have we have the studies and the science to prove that this practice right here, the standard practice that you do with every mom and baby is not only unhelpful, but downright harmful. And not only are we practicing that on every single one of them, but me who am in the system as a patient at this point in time, brought it to your attention and was like, Hey, I did my research on this and I don't want to do this. So thank you, but no, thank you. Um, They would fight me and use fear tactics and have me, they overpower you. And it makes it really hard, especially when you're the only one who's read the studies and nobody in your life wants to listen to you because how could you possibly know better than the doctor? And so they just automatically take the doctor's side and things. It it really puts people who are trying to do the right thing and be an advocate for themselves and do the best for themselves and their family in a hard place. I've heard the same story. And unfortunately, I mean, I have friends 
who have studied medicine and uh, I'll tell a story. I had a friend, she just became a doctor. This was mm, about four years ago. She just got in her residency at a hospital. And she said to me, I am so scared. Mm. I said, why? why are you scared? Because I don't know anything about medicine. <laughs> yeah. Those were her actual words. She said, they gave me a book and a bunch of other papers on my desk. And they were basically like, have at it. And these patients are coming to me. And I don't really wow. see how what they have listed as the cause in the book is related to what they want to do. And I don't know where to go with this because it seems like if I do the right thing, I'll lose my job. Yep. And she just got the job. So she's like, I just spent seven years to find out that it's like this. Mm -hmm. So could you imagine how many other doctors have had that same experience where they realize that, you know, the root cause of things is not being addressed. Mm -hmm. And in order to be able to work ever again, because as soon as you drop out, you're blacklisted. Yep. You couldn't be like, oh, I made a mistake. Maybe I should become a naturopath or something and go get a job doing that. No, you would be blacklisted. Mm hmm. And oh no, they sure don't want anybody exploring stuff like that who actually have credibility and medical degrees. Exactly. So to anybody that's hearing this kind of information for the first time, have some compassion. Like, why is that? Really think, why is it that medicine doesn't want medicine? Mm -hmm. Why is that? I mean, I'm sure you were annoyed when people were telling you don't drink that herbal tea or like it's peppermint. What's wrong with you? you know, like, <laughs> 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 but then we're getting trained again into all these unhelpful ways of thinking. The carnivore diet, for example, mm. is a, a fad diet. Keto is a fad diet mm -hmm. and it becomes like a cult mindset. Mm -hmm. People see a very small result and they go, oh, it works. But in reality, whether or not we're supposed to eat meat is irrelevant to the discussion. Are you getting enough nutrition? You're not getting it from all meat. Meat mm -hmm. is dead. You can only get so much recycled B vitamins from your meat before you need to get something else from somewhere else. Because basically when you put all of something in your body, other elements of your body begin to get depleted. I'm trying to say it very simply for people to understand. So if you go on any fad diet, it's going to make you feel good at first because your gut bacteria change mm -hmm. momentarily. But then you have to counteract the effects of nutrient depletion from other things elsewhere. That's why vegans, all their hair falls out, you know, the teeth get all rickety and stuff because they think cucumbers alone is going to do the job. It's not, you know, it doesn't work that way. We so, need a lot of variety. Exactly. And we have to be willing to take responsibility for our health, not expect Dr. Atkins to solve the problem for us or whoever, and really learn, get back to our roots. Mm -hmm. From the farm to the table, as they used to say, that's yeah. the way it used to be. And that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. it, it, you can't expect <laughs> Cheetos to to get you anywhere you know yeah we really do need to start growing more of our own food but that creates its problems all on its own you know like the system has not been designed to easily allow us to grow our own food at all you know a lot of people don't have a yard um you can do container gardening but only for some things I prefer I've always preferred container gardening I've been gardening for probably 12 or 13 years now and I'm still terrible at it and I kill most things and I liked container gardening because it was I could move things around and you know oh this plant doesn't look like it's getting enough sunlight let me move it over here and then you know that way you're not oh well there's not getting enough sunlight but it's already in the ground there's nothing I can do about it uh that allowed me a little bit more experimentation with it which I know we could definitely research 
each individual plant. But when people are already like booked solid with everything else they got going on in their life, it's hard to, okay, I have to research not only this plant and the best place it to plant it, but all of its predators and what I need to do about you know inse insects that are going to eat it before I can get to it oh but now the birds are after it so now I have to like build something that protects it from the birds and you know it gets really overwhelming really quick and then you right. have um the narrative also makes us afraid of the food that comes from our garden because I mean what if there's parasites what if there's bacteria and you can definitely just wash it really well but well, there's already parasites in your mm. Doritos. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. we, like I said, we don't know what has been done to anything that we eat mm -hmm. when we get it from the store. We could as well take the chance and get back to our roots. Mm -hmm. But there are very few parasites on an apple compared to what is on a McDonald's burger, you know? And, the, and, and you know, this is the thing... I would never get into a debate or a discussion telling anybody what to put in their body. Yeah. But eat a little bit more fruit, eat a little bit more vegetables, mm -hmm. and your life is going to change because those things help push all the toxic stuff out. That's mm -hmm. all you need to know. Yeah. That's literally all you need to know. And w w the other thing that you need to know is that we have all these different things that are essentially weaponized against us whether it's intentional or, or not like i won't say the v word injections mm -hmm. for one not just the le the latest injection mm -hmm. all of them you know oh, that yes. that some of those things have good intentions behind them but we don't know what's in them and it has been discovered that the filler agents are toxic mm -hmm. yeah other things that began well-intentioned and ended up being not so good like caffeine products mm -hmm. mess with us block our nutrient absorption keep us in fight or flight shut our brain um activity down to 52 percent and so sometimes when we think we're thinking we're really not actually having a full uh depth of thought as we could mm -hmm. um alcohol <laughs> We need to do that in moderation. And if you're a person that you're capable of not at all, that's even better mm -hmm. because you're just making your organs work really hard. And it's having the same effect on you as if you're taking um, poison, essentially. Mm -hmm. We spend so much time putting pharmaceuticals and sugar and uh, really poorly produced milk Mm -hmm. and drinking all this fluoridated water and smoking all this stuff <laughs> you know it's, i'm just gonna say stuff because there's a lot of stuff that people smoke these days and, and all of it's inherently bad once you smoke it yeah right but these are all things that have been taken from one form to another plants that have been taken from one form put it into another form that gives us a high mm -hmm. and destroys the body and the body's wanting to compensate for that. And again, your limbic system is activated. You're afraid. You might feel confident, but you have no idea how afraid you actually are. Mm -hmm. your, your body's suffering, you know. And with the advent of GMOs and EMF radiation and um, whatever's happening in the sky, <laughs> we've got a lot of toxins to push out of the body. So... What the hell does any of this have to do with self sabotage? Everything, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Because as long as you are doing something that's inhibiting your ability to live your best life and feel your greatest, and it's aging you, making you sick, mm -hmm. and affecting the way that you think, that's self sabotage. Mm -hmm. And so, so many people come to me for coaching. I would have to say, if I gave it a number out of every hundred people. 94 of them use caffeine, sugar, smoke something, drink something, eat junk food, whatever the case is. And that's that makes up a large part of what we have to work on because when they're in fear like that, it's really hard for them. Or when I shouldn't even say just in fear, 
when they're putting things things in the body that are subtracting from their overall energy mm-hmm. it's really hard for them to tap in and dig deep and do the deep work and they can't push past certain barriers in their lives mm-hmm. so that's what this has to do with self-sabotage essentially absolutely and people get overwhelmed because you know everything causes cancer these days oh yeah but they think that since everything causes bad things to happen that they should just ignore it all and just keep on keeping on anyway then because YOLO. <laughs> I remember yeah. when they said that <laughs> yeah. but you know you can lessen the burden on your body a little bit you know and we're not we're not saying definitely don't actually go out and try to overhaul everything overnight because that's just going to cause more stress and more overwhelm and then resentment because you're trying so hard and for what more stress well more stress is going to make me sick and kill me too and it's always easier if you know that you have say for example someone comes to you and they say hey savannah i need to stop smoking can Mm -hmm. you help me and you say okay well eat an apple Mm -hmm. and they're they're going to be surprised because they're waiting for you to say don't smoke anymore right yeah, but it's easier to add in a healthy habit than Not to take away it. something, right? Proud so that's what we have to do. We have to add in healthy things, and self sabotage, overcoming self sabotage, is about leveraging the cost. Life is a series of trade offs, and we have to get accustomed to that. Mm-hmm. Everything comes at a cost. Mm-hmm. We live in a completely participatory universe where everything is cause and effect Mm -hmm. if we want a better effect we have to create causality with more leverage it has a better return on investment essentially and people don't understand that they think oh i have to stop this thing and they start biting their nails like oh now i gotta stop biting my nails too and they're like all these different things start happening because they're afraid Mm -hmm. and it doesn't even make sense focusing on fear to overcome it. You just kind of have to see that it's there, move past it and try to do something that's good. And when you get confidence from feeling good, feeling a little bit better, that gives you the incentive to look at this other thing that's going on in your life and say, okay, I'm going to tackle that, but very slowly. Mm -hmm. So there are so many people that will, like you said, they, they, they just get overwhelmed. And they're trying to change all these things on their own. And they don't understand that nobody's demanding anything of them Mm. except for themselves. It's all self-imposed to begin with. Yeah. Just draw the damn curtain, man. Just open the window. (laughs) That's all you do. Open the window and let the fresh air in. Yeah. You have to start ripping everything down and repaint the room. And, you know, (laughs) you don't do that all at once. I love your direction though, because yeah, you're right. When you're trying to, if you acknowledge a problem, everybody's first natural instinct is to, oh, quit it, quit the problem. And no, you don't need to stop doing, you need to start doing something in the opposite direction of the problem. And that'll just naturally crowd out the problem over time. Yeah. And forget about goal setting too i never do goal setting in my practice with anyone that may sound like surprising because people think that's what coaching is mm-hmm. and that's kind of what it has become you build your vision for your future you know yes you need to see yourself in a different place that's a part of the and because the subconscious thinks that whatever you visualize or whatever you watch on tv that's reality mm-hmm. so Yes, you want to use that as a tool, but how do you get there? Well, you have to change all of the emotions that keep you where you are. Mm -hmm. And that should be so simple. However, so many people still don't get that. It's your emotions that keep you stuck. It's what you put in your body that triggers these emotions that keep you stuck. It's what you are thinking habitually, your judgments of people, your judgments of yourself, your inability to have compassion for yourself because that's a huge one Mm -hmm. especially with women between 35 to 45 i've noticed in my practice 
Hmm. No self compassion. No. They're right. very nurturing towards everyone except for themselves. Yes. Right. That's more conditioning, though. Yeah. It and is. men don't know how to open up and not be more nurturing and more compassionate because they know how to. It, they're just not hardwired to do that. And for centuries, we have we were supposed to be the killing gender, essentially. We're supposed to be the ones that chop the heads off of the bad guys and bring home the meat and things like that. And so that's hardwired into us. And we don't know how to do anything other than shut off our emotions. Because you have right? to to be able to do such things. Exactly. So if you're tired and your wife tells you take the garbage out and you don't want to, what do you do? You shut down because that's how you respond to a threat. All the time. It would have been the same way if you were getting chased by a bison. <laughs> you shut down, you turn off that emotion, and you turn around and you face it. Right? So it, there's so much stuff that we have to overcome. And I, I don't want to plug coaching, but everybody needs to find oh, yeah. the time and the money to invest in something like that. Because now more than ever... We are struggling because we don't have a sense of community. Mm -hmm. These things, the death rectangles, these have caused us to have less connection, less feeling of community, less feeling of support than ever before. Even when we're around our friends, we don't think that we're really in, on a subconscious level really being held and taken in a, a good direction. So... That's why so many people are falling out with all their friends and their family these days. We're also getting trained into that with the content that we take in. As soon as somebody isn't who you think they should be for you, cut them off. Literally, yeah. it's we're real quick to cut people off because, you know, we're aware of all the red flags now. And we're aware that we don't have to deal with people's crap if we don't want to. So, yeah. but it's a smaller world than you think. Yeah. <laughs> But the problem is, is that none of us are perfect and we're going to have bad days. We're going to have, even me and you, we're hyper aware of who we are and how we are every day, but we still have bad days and get distracted and then we get stuck in our heads and then we might miss somebody else's cue and now they're mad at us and we didn't even realize anything was happening, you know, and we have to really take a step back and weigh the pros and cons of each relationship and figure out where our boundaries are and what we're willing to uh, cultivate and what we're not willing to participate in and really use some discretion because you're exactly right. We do need to focus more on building our communities back, getting that support. We're social creatures. Yeah. And boundaries is another thing that's kind of been weaponized too. There's so much misinformation about boundaries and mm -hmm. how to set boundaries and things like that. But boundaries is about communication. Mm -hmm. It's about keeping the best parts of you in and not keeping other people out. Mm -hmm. And so when people set boundaries these days, because they've seen a list of 10 ways to set boundaries on Instagram or something, they go and they take it literally yeah and apply it and they start just chopping people off or yep. alienating people or you know saying you can't say that like why not we're having a conversation mm -hmm. let us communicate but mm -hmm. it becomes a barrier to effective communication where people mm -hmm. don't want to listen to each other they just want to have their own way and not have any of your input whatsoever but mm -hmm. we're all co-creating together yeah. And it's ridiculous how people are acting. <laughs> yeah. I get accused a lot in my uh, home life, personal interactions, friends, family, all of that, of uh, creating drama because, yeah, bound. you're right. Boundaries have been misconstrued to where, um, oh, I'm protecting my boundaries. So I just cut that person off. But, and no, I didn't tell them why. I just stopped talking to them. I ghosted them. They don't deserve an explanation. They were being toxic. <laughs> and it's like, uh, no, the healthy boundaries is about communicating and being like, hey, this right here made me uncomfortable. Uh, how you feel about that? How you, what do you think we should do from here? Because, you know, you want to cultivate these relationships and that means being honest about how you feel. And that means 
having the hard conversations, the uncomfortable conversations, the awkward conversations so that y'all can find common ground because everybody lives in their own little reality bubble. And the only way that we can see into each other's reality bubbles and find common ground is to talk about it. But that can be uncomfortable. And that kind of goes back to what we were saying before, before the advent of technology, where we had to talk to each other, we were forced to. And sometimes the men would go outside. Even when I was growing up, we had problems with each other as boys. We'd go outside and beat each other up mm-hmm. and then lift each other up off the ground, dust each other off and then go play. Mm-hmm. Right. Or, or do whatever, you know. So um, the boundaries thing, I guess, to bring it back to something you were saying, like when you were talking about how the doctors are trained in these universities and stuff like that on the science. Well, what is that? That's cult conditioning. But Mm -hmm. those research establishments, those institutions are the think tanks that I was alluding to. Mm -hmm. Ideas come from these places. So the same is true for psychology. And that's where the boundaries and the toxic and the trauma and these things are coming down the pipeline from these sources. And this is not a conspiracy thing. You can check that out and you can realize. It's all out there. You know, if just because Andrew Huberman says, don't do this. Well, why is he saying that? Stanford pays him to say that. Mm -hmm. Like, do people not understand that? Stanford is a think tank. It's an idea machine. It's trying to form the ideas that we all conform to. Mm -hmm. And that's not individualism. That's not living a free life. And so self-sabotage, we do it in our relationships mm-hmm. using these things like the trauma cult. Everything that happened between zero to seven is what is causing us problems in our life. No, sometimes you poke around in somebody's subconscious for days, months, and absolutely nothing that is the problem in their life right now is as a result of their childhood. But because the trauma cult says that, We should believe that. And every single person out there is a paid actor or an unpaid actor, an unpaid agent of the state parroting a narrative. Mm -hmm. Childhood trauma does not exist as much as people think it does. There's just people who have hijacked the developmental psychological narrative and ran with it because it keeps you stuck, keeps you small, keeps you paying coaches. I, I said it keeps you paying psychologists and keeps you taking pills Mm -hmm. and keeps you small, keeps you feeling helpless. It gives you a reason because we have 400 plus mental filters, cognitive distortions that we pass information through. And one of them is there's something wrong with me. There has to be something wrong with me. So when a person gets information that justifies that and fires that off, if it's activists in someone's mind, They say, oh, childhood trauma, that's what's wrong with me. I don't have to actually do anything about that. No, Mm -hmm. right? That person's toxic. The same thing. That person's just toxic. I don't actually have to talk to them about how their behavior affects me. Mm -hmm. Granted, people will say disempowering things like, you did this thing and Savannah, you said this yesterday and made me feel this way. Well, as soon as you say it made me feel you disempower yourself. Hmm. Now you can't have a conversation because you're not taking responsibility for the fact that the emotions that you feel are generated inside of you, yeah. right? Absolutely. And so when people begin to think in this way, they can realize, okay, I need to go step away, process this, come back with some questions for this person and see how well they receive it. Because the only way you can tell if a person is toxic is if they don't receive the things that you've said kindly to them well, <laughs> yes. pretty much. Right? Absolutely. So that's the way it is. It is until it's not, but that's what we're doing here, right? Mm-hmm. Showing people, opening up the door because yeah, we've all been marinated in these narratives. And now not only are we opening up the door to other ways of being, other ways of interacting, other ways of thinking, Um, learning, but we have to create a whole new language essentially around these new thoughts. And that takes time, but 
you know, we've got the rest of our lives to do it, right? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, we do. We're here till we die. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, this has been wonderful. You've given us a lot to unpack and think about today. And I really appreciate that. I hope everybody else enjoyed it as much as I have. You want to tell everybody how to find you? And of course, I'll link everything around. Okay. So my website's under construction as of today. So just send me an email at self sabotage info at proton.me. There you go. And then you can follow me on Instagram. I respond on there as well at Jahan Sator. So that's J E H A N S A T T A U R. Awesome. And I'll make sure that all of that gets linked and we'll get people to you. Awesome. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You have a great day.